My family life, I grew up very sheltered, very, you know, close community of people and the religion. And I didn't use drugs when I was young at all. I left home when I was 20, I should tell you that, because that's when I came out as being gay. So I left my family and I was pretty much ostracized from my family and the religion. And so I got involved with this woman from work who was an an addict, and I didn't even know what an addict was. You know, I was extremely sheltered, I was very naive coming out into the world. So I just felt like she had, she needed someone to love her. And if she could, could get enough love, then she would be a different person. And she introduced me to marijuana, then cocaine, powder, you know, everybody, in the 80s, so everybody was doing cocaine, just trying everything. You know, I, I was so naive, I was like, oh, that's acid? I never heard of that, let's try that. Oh, that's mushrooms? I never heard of that, let's try that. You know, whatever people had, I would try. I didn't think drugs were bad. I didn't think they could hurt you. I believe I lost control over drugs when I was late in my 20s. I got out of the relationship with the, the woman who was an addict, that was when I was 21. And after that, I was with a partner and we got involved with selling cocaine powder. I could see things getting out of control there, but I was still the caretaker. I was watching how she, you know, oh, she's getting bad. She's taking it to work with her now in a little vial. She's, you know, what people were doing. I was kind of like really, like I said, extremely codependent. And I, I used myself, but I was more conscious of what other people did. I think I noticed my own addiction. It was when I started smoking crack in 1987. I stopped being social with it. You know, I would bring it to parties like everybody would bring drugs to parties. And what do you got? You got this, this. So I started doing it by myself. I didn't want to share it. I didn't want to deal with people's tweaks, you know. So then I realized I had a problem. I found out I was HIV positive in 1990. I was sick. And I went to the doctors here. I went to Tom Waddell. And they said to me, yeah, it looks like you have bronchitis. And it didn't feel, I felt, I was hor I was just, it felt like the flu bronchitis, and they didn't test me for anything, nothing. Never even assumed I could be positive, right? And I think it was because I said I was a lesbian, because you know, they didn't test lesbians back then. Finally, after two months of going to this doctor regularly, he finally said, well, you know what? We're just gonna give you an extensive blood test. We're gonna go ahead and throw in HIV, just for the hell of it. Okay. So two weeks later, I get the results and it was positive. And I looked at him and I said, uh, you need to go do that again because something's wrong. The second time it came back positive, um, I just kind of went numb. He told me I had a year to live. He said, looking at your T-cells, you have a 300 and something T-cells, you got about a year to live. And I didn't want to believe him. You know, I said, you are, he's, he's lying to me. Of course he wants me to die. You know, he's, you know, he sees I'm an addict, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he wants me dead. So I refused to believe it. I remember I took an AZT pill once and I got really, really sick. And I was like, I'm not gonna take this. And I was against all meds at that point. I didn't believe it. So I started doing um, the holistic approach. I was doing Chinese herbs. I was doing acupuncture. I was healthy as I'll get out, but I was losing T cells. So when I got down to seven T cells, I got sick. I got toxoplasmosis and I'm in the hospital and like, toxoplasmosis is this brain, you get lesions on your brain. And I started losing features, like, you know, being able to stand up by myself and stuff like that. So when I was in the hospitals, when I decided to go on meds, um, that was 1997, I started HIV meds. I believed in them because when I started them, I had 70 cells, and two weeks later, I had 280. I said, okay, they're working. That's all I needed to be convinced of, you know? So I've been taking them ever since, and it's been many, I've been positive for 31 years. I didn't get clean because I was positive. I was still using it when I was diagnosed. I got clean because yeah, I needed a place to live. It was 94, it was around New Year's Eve, and I came, flew to San Francisco, and I had a friend here, an ex-girlfriend, who I, we used to use together. So I looked her up, I found her, and I said, hey, it's New Year's Eve, let's party tonight. And she said, I'll take you to a party. And she took me to a Living Sober dance and with AA. And when I got there, I was kind of like, She's like, nobody here is using. I said, no way, because people were having so much fun. So when I got back to her house, I said, can I stay here a while? And she said, well, you can stay here, but you're going to need to go into recovery in order to stay here, because she was in recovery now. So you're going to need to go into a program. I mean, what the, what, what's a program, you know? And so she, I, I looked around for some programs, and I found one, and I got into a program that took HIV-positive people. 
mostly in the gay men program where there was a lot of men, it was easier to be out with my status. I found that the lesbian community was still kind of, they still had a lot of stigma towards HIV. They were like, oh, they either, you've been fucking men or you're an IV drug user or, you know, they got all of these ideas about why you're positive, you know. I started meeting these amazing people and I started meeting these people who were like having as much fun as I thought I was having on drugs. I liked the choices I was making in my life, you know, and I was happy. I was really happy and I was clean and sober for 12 years. I went to locksmith school when I was 41. Did really well, got a job at UCSF, you know, journeyman level over the years. And in 2006, I had an accident at work when I fractured my back. And my partner at the time wasn't the kind of caretaking kind of partner. You know, it's like, okay, you're still in the, are you still laying on the couch today? Can you get up and do something? I'm thinking I have a fractured back. So I wasn't happy in my relationship and I was really depressed and had a really hard time being immobile. So I was, as on my way, from, way home from physical therapy one day, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna break up with this woman. I'm like, you know what, I can't do this anymore. So I said, I'll just get some crack, I'll bring it home. She'll say, you gotta go, get out. So I bring this crack home and I said, oh, by the way, I brought some crack home. And it kind of backfired on me. She said, oh, I've always wanted to use that, try that. So that was the beginning of, that broke my sobriety right there. And she and I went on a run for two and a half years about, yeah, just kind of, yeah. What I wish for the recovery community, I wish there was more support for people who relapse. It's just like, you know, when it's in the church, you get, you, you get disfellowship, you're ousted out. Nobody talks to you, people are afraid of you, people treat you like, oh my God. I had so many friends when I was in recovery and then I lost them. Like they just went away. And I felt like when I needed them most is when they went away. You know, when you're, when you're relapsing, that's when you need people to call you and say, hey, still love you, but, but it's like all of a sudden you're by yourself, you know? So it was you and, and that drug. I left and I went, to, went back to my family, actually, in 2008. I didn't use when I was with them. So I was with them for almost five years, clean and sober, but I went back to the religion with them because that's the only way I could be with them if I was in the religion. So I did that for a while, but I also had to go back in the closet. My mother knew I was positive, but never talked about it. No one ever talked about it. So I felt like I was back in the closet again with my status and with being gay. The religion was like, yeah, you can be gay, but you just can't act on it. You know, we don't, we don't hate you people. We just don't want you to act on that. So I'm like, what? So I'm supposed to be alone? When I got clean and sober, the thing that was most amazing to me was um, how I felt about myself. You know, I felt good. I didn't feel any shame. I would tell my story and tell the whole, like I say, I would tell the whole story, the good, bad, and the ugly, because I had a lot of shame in my life, um, even before the drugs, just grew up with it, you know, uh, abuse and stuff like that. Um, so I didn't talk about my, I didn't talk about any of that when I was younger, when I was a teenager. So like, this is my truth. I'm telling my truth and no one's gonna kick me to the curb because of it. No one's gonna be afraid of me because of it, you know, and that felt really good, you know, and I feel like I do, I could go and be anywhere in the world if I had that truth, I'd be able to share that truth. And, and I did that. 